Uh, so Lauren is the Associate Vice President for New Haven Affairs and University Properties at Yale University. Um, and based on what I've read about Lauren, she handles everything within the New Haven community, relations with Yale and Yale Properties, and it's probably somebody I'll be speaking with as the new owner of the Cambria Hotel. So <laughs> Lauren, welcome, and uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Francis, and good morning, everyone. We're delighted to see you all today for our panel. As Francis said, I am Lauren Zucker, and I am going to be moderating this panel this morning. So I'm going to start by briefly asking um, each of our panelists to talk, to introduce themselves. Now, their full bio should be in the program that you have, but I want them to introduce themselves in context to 101 College and what their relationship is to the project. And I'll just go straight down the line, starting with Carter Wynn Stanley. Great, thank you, Lauren. Uh, my name is Carter Wynn Stanley. I'm a principal at Wynn Stanley Enterprises, and we are the developer of both 100 College and 101 College. Um, hi, my name is Dave Liu. I am with Harrison Street. Uh, we are a um, investor nationally and internationally in kind of alternative real assets. Um, life sciences being one of our main sectors, and so we are one of the we are one of the main investors in 101 College. Good morning. My name is Michael Piscatelli. I'm the economic development administrator for the city. Uh, first, on behalf of Mayor Ellick, our, our entire team, thank you for coming to New Haven today. For many of you who are, are coming back maybe for the first time in some time, um, our role for with this particular project relates to our overall work plan, which is uh, the public infrastructure to support inclusive growth in our city, connecting residents to that opportunity and staying closely aligned with the economic sectors that are growing here. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the program. Good morning. I'm Josh Jabal. I'm the managing director of Yale Ventures. Uh, Yale Ventures is a new organization that the university created to bring together all of the programs that we have that support entrepreneurship and innovation across the university. And so um, our, our connection to this discussion is really a, a lot of the tenants that are uh, both going to be initially in 101 and more generally are feeding the demand for lab space and, and development uh, in New Haven are uh, often Yale spinouts. Um, and so our role is to help take a lot of the billion dollars that get Yale invests each year in research and help translate that into new startup companies, new partnerships that can develop those technologies uh, and often drives a significant demand for, for real estate and lab space here in New Haven. Great, thank you all. And I should have said at the beginning, there will be time for Q&A at the end. So I'll start by asking a few questions, but at the end, there'll be ample time to answer any questions anyone has. So we can't talk about a project without actually talking about the project. Um, why don't we put up a slide of what 101 College is going to look like, and I'm going to turn it over to Carter. Can you give us just a brief description of 101 in the building? Great. Uh, so 101 College is a 10-story, half a million square foot life science uh, project that's new construction. It's part of the downtown crossing. Uh, project in New Haven, and it's actually a sister building to 100 College, uh, which if you're looking at this rendering on the right side of the rendering, that's 100 College. That's the building currently occupied by Alexion and Yale University. And 101 College is the next building in that downtown crossing uh, development. As I said, it's special purpose lab or life science building. Uh, it's designed specifically to accommodate tenants like Alexion or Venice um, and some of the small startup companies that are coming out of Josh's office. <clears throat> What's very exciting from my standpoint, having worked in New Haven on the life science sector over the last 23 years, is we're really beginning to see a maturing of this industry in New Haven. Uh, we've developed over 2 million square feet of life science projects in town. Uh, there's tremendous demand for these projects today. Uh, it's coming from a number of tenants that are growing organically 
out of the university system in town here, primarily out of Yale, but also out of UConn and the other universities in Connecticut. Uh, I would say that uh, the Downtown Crossing project contemplates uh, several other buildings, and I think as this demand really comes together, uh, we'll see more opportunities for these buildings. Uh, I would say as we came into this market 23 years ago, uh, I think of it as life science development, maybe 1.0, and we're on maybe 11 or 12.0 right now. Uh, you know, what we're seeing on the stage today really represents university investment, development, uh, the city, and state involvement. And we'll probably talk a lot about all of those factors in what makes a successful market. And today, this is a very streamlined group that uh, leads me to be very excited about the future of New Haven and life science. Thanks, Carter. I mean, how long does it take to develop something like this? When did you have the first <laughs> inkling that you wanted to do 101 College? Uh, I would say my first inkling really started 23 years ago when uh, we first came to town and I sat with Bruce Alexander and John Soderstrom uh, who convinced me uh, at the time I was in my 20s and uh, I think I was easily convinced uh, that all of the raw materials were in town to really create a life science sector. And uh, by raw materials, there was a deep pool of intellectual property in place. Uh, there was great tech transfer starting to come together. There was municipal involvement, state involvement. All of those raw materials were there. So when we first came to town and started looking at developments like this, uh, it was really just a concept, and we hadn't broken ground on anything. And the first project we did was actually 300 George Street, uh, which was half a million square feet of former phone company uh, space uh, right next to the med school. And that project was a pretty quick turnaround in that it took us seven years. <laughs> As the project uh, started to fill, we envisioned 100 College uh, working closely with Mike at the time. Uh, that project took us almost 10 years from the point of first conceiving of the idea, taking it through what was close to 75 public hearings uh, you know, in relation to shutting the highway down, rerouting traffic, seeking uh, public investment for the infrastructure that would be required. I remember people getting up in the public hearings talking about the fact that we were going to create uh, traffic Armageddon uh, by rerouting all of the traffic in the downtown. And fortunately, we did not create traffic Armageddon. We actually improved traffic, I think, in town. Um, so the first project was seven years. 100 College was probably 10 years in the making. And then remarkably, we took 101 College through uh, the public approval process on day one of COVID. I mean, uh, I think the city was extraordinary in uh, creating and what at the time was a Zoom process for public hearings. And I had never been on Zoom. I had never heard of Zoom. <laughs> Nobody was equipped for it. And they created a remarkable process for public involvement uh, to keep the project moving in the initial days of COVID. Remarkably, we got that project approved in less than a year. Uh, we were running the design uh, in parallel with that public approval process and started construction just over a year ago. Uh, we're halfway through construction and should be complete by June or July of next year, ready to start building out uh, tenant spaces. So I would say with 
the maturing of the market, each step of the way, the process has become more efficient. Great, thank you. Um, so David, first of all, welcome back to SOM, your alma mater. I know it's a different building than when you were, uh, when you were a student here, but yeah. it must feel good to be back. It's a little uh, different than the all mirrors <laughs> that we used to have. Um, so, so Harrison Street has investments all over the country. Why New Haven? Why 101? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think when we're looking at life science investments, it's, it's, it's a lot of the stuff that Kyra was just talking about, but we look, we look at markets and we try to understand kind of what the life sciences and biotech ecosystem looks like there and, and how healthy it is and, and how kind of sustainable it is. Um, you know, and so when you look at New Haven, I think all you got to do is look at the, the hard corner that Carter and, and Yale have, um, have really built with 100 College and, and 300 George. And I, I personally, in a former life, had the, uh, the honor of asset managing those two buildings and, and developing a relationship with, with Carter and Yale a little bit. So um, knowing just how thriving that ecosystem um, really is and, and everything that's been built over the last 20 years or so um, gave us confidence to, to invest um, in this ecosystem. And the second thing, obviously, um, is Yale, right? And the, sponsor, and the institutional sponsor that, that Yale really has been for, for this ecosystem. And so that, that comes from tech transfer and the IP that's coming out of the university in addition to kind of the partnership as far as occupying some of these buildings and, and being an active participant in the ecosystem. So, you know, between those two things, um, it, it was an incredible opportunity to get, get, get involved. And then the final thing is really community and whether or not the community, um, A, understands life sciences and, and B, kind of encourages it. And, uh, with this project and uh, folks like Michael uh, and the city of New Haven tr truly encouraging it. And, and on my end, I understand how much um, and how many different stakeholders it takes to get a project like this uh, completed and, and off the ground. And, and that this, this project certainly has that. And we at Harrison Street are very, very um, honored and um, fortunate to be a part of it. Great. So that's a perfect segue to Mike. Mike, what is the role of the city in a project like this? So um, a number of different roles, right? And I think in reflection of what we're hearing so far, um, I'm struck by the, the importance that we've um, placed on not skipping any steps in this process, that building upon what we did with 100 College Street was really, really important. There were, when this image was first drawn, about 10,300 residents in the city filing for continuing unemployment claims. And none of the stimulus programs that we see today were approved were talked about, they weren't necessarily approved. So when we embarked on this, it had a lot to do with the proof of concept that we had worked on for many, many years, closing five highway ramps, really doing the work to make sure that we were doing this the right way, in part because New Haven, on a per capita basis, received more money during the urban renewal period than any other city in the country. And there were damages associated with that. And we're still going through a long period of reconciling with our community and staying closely attached, which many innovation districts around the country wrestle with, was a very important part of the deeper role that the city had. So we're doing this infrastructure, you know, out there tearing out the highway, and we're working a development agreement on the fundamental fairness of like deal points. But really what it was was staying attached with our community and understanding the connectivity between this meaningful nature of the work that's happening here. The, the fact that many New Haven scientists are changing health outcomes for people in their own family, let alone around the world, and that it's accessible work at every level of job in the building and in this district. There's um, a partnership agreement which Carter has with um, the New Haven Works Jobs Pipeline to make sure that New Haven residents have access to work across the building. And then in our partnerships with Southern Connecticut State University on the biopath, they had 110, 120 students and in internships this year. And this particular project will have a classroom in it for New Haven Public Schools. And um, one of the lead scientists who will take space in the building is working on an adult certification program as well. And if you start you know, stitching this together, you can see a more complete story of how you can move through an accelerated process during COVID, uncertain times, um, because of this deep, deep attachment with the community and the trust that we're building over time. 
And I would suggest that we have to build that every day, right? Like there's never a point where you say that that's done. And each project, largely thanks to the, to the commitment of the team, makes that one step better. And you see that in the design in particular, this particular project. There is no parking garage with this project. Um, the parking is you know, basically gonna be managed throughout our system. And that opens up a new public plaza that our community and alders felt very strongly about. That there'd be a sense of belonging on this site and that it wouldn't be just a walled off community. And New Haven Public School students will have a tag just like this and they'll swipe in and swipe out when they're in school. And, um, and that's gonna really matter and it will help us move to next. And you know, today in part it's about pitching next, right? Because we have a long way to go to fully build out. How many steps did you have in your process there? You know, 20.1 before we get yeah. all the way home. And Mike, can you also talk a little bit about um, state and federal involvement in, in a project like this? How supportive, um, talk maybe about the Tiger Grant that you received to enable some of this work. Yeah, so I think uh, over the years, um, the, the discretionary grant programs, either state or federal, are no longer have sort of the independent utility that we used to know, where you, know, you go build a road and it's independent utility as a road is what you're basically scored on. Um, today, our you know, programs, if you will, want to see job growth, um, high level of commitment to the overall municipal plan and the, and the growth of the city as a whole, and you're held to that standard. So it's very important for us to continue to, to if we're gonna move forward as a city and really um, set ourselves up for success going forward, to have great development partners, uh, projects in the real estate space, the meaningful nature of work, what Josh will talk a little bit about, um, because you just can't move a ball forward without that second part of the story and the attachment. Um, you may have seen in the news, um, we're, the two next grants for us are all about coastal resiliency, uh, but it's the same sort of thing, like it's not, it's not a, a pipe for stormwater just to do a pipe. It's to really protect and grow a community. So Josh, you've been head of Yale Ventures for what, about seven months now? So uh, fully on the job. Um, and Carter, I think, will tell you that the success of 101 is very much dependent upon the work that you do in terms of spinning out new ventures from Yale and from other labs. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the relationship that you have with 101 in that regard and, and the ecosystem in New Haven in terms of creating new biotech companies? Sure. Um, so I think, I think the success of 101 actually is, is largely already baked uh, based on the work, uh, you know, in the past years of, you know, someone mentioned John Soderstrom and Bruce and others, and this momentum that's been built up over the last uh, decade or two of um, 70 biotech startups CL spun out in the last seven years. Um, and many of those end up not being successful, as you know, that industry, but many of them do. And um, you know, one of the main anchor tenants in 101 is a company that was spun out of Yale in 2013, I believe, uh, called Arvinus, which IPO'd uh, three years ago um, and continues to grow as an independent company very successfully and is going to be taking a significant amount of space in 101. Um, equally, uh, Alexion was mentioned earlier. That was a Yale spin out uh, about 20 years ago, I think, maybe even a little longer at this point that um, also IPO'd, um, uh, had a little bump in the road where they had a new CEO who lived up in Boston and decided he didn't want to move, so they moved some headquarters jobs up there, but the research operation stayed here, and I think the general employment count here in New Haven kind of never really wavered that much. But they were acquired last year by AstraZeneca, um, who uh, we all held our breath a little bit on what was AstraZeneca's plan going to be, and, and as it turns out, their plan is to double down on New Haven. And so they're now growing further. They're taking more space in 101. And they're gonna uh, increase by about 50% the size of their R&D staff here in New Haven. And AstraZeneca has declared this New Haven Lexion site as their rare disease research uh, hub uh, globally. Um, and of course, Yale continues to grow, right? Our own research enterprise continues to grow. The medical school um, <coughs> continues to grow and will be a tenant there as well. And then the other key element at 101 is uh, Biolabs, um, which was a, a project that I know Lauren and, and Mike Crayer and other administrators at Yale um, identified this need for very early, uh, lab space for very early stage spin outs. So when they're just spinning out of Yale and they're very small scale and they may only have a couple of employees and they're on that seed round or they're on that series A round and they're trying to get the data together to get to the next financing, 
they don't have a lot of money, they need to be scrappy, they may only need a lab bench or two, and it was important for us to have space um, very close to the medical school in particular where those startups could take root. Um, and so uh, we partnered with Biolabs, which is a national uh, chain of uh, lab incubators where you can essentially rent a bench by the month, uh, you know, kind of turnkey model with all of the lab equipment already invested, a bunch of, you know, very rich services and amenities wrapped around it. And uh, so we've brought uh, Biolabs to New Haven. Um, they're already actually open for business while construction is finished on Yale West Campus. And then as soon as uh, the second floor is ready for them, they'll be moving in uh, to the second floor uh, here at 101. So, you know, 101, I think, is, is a great example of, like, as this builds up over time, the demand is there. But, you know, we're already thinking about the next project because, you know, we're, the work that we're doing at Yale Ventures right now um, is only going to further open the floodgates of Yale IP and Yale inventions out into commercialized uh, applications. And so, you know, we anticipate in the coming years the demand for more space only continuing to build. And so, you know, I'm really excited about, you know, already the next projects, right, and kind of the march, right, from, uh, you know, from where these developments are, you know, kind of down towards the train station. There's a lot of space in there. And, you know, it's very easy to kind of blur your eyes and envision, you know, 10, 20 years down the road. That whole area is completely filled in with buildings like this. And we've got an incredibly robust, thriving uh, bioscience ecosystem. Although I would point out that it's not just bioscience at this point, too. That has been kind of our bread and butter over the years. But we have tremendous investments the university is making right now in our School of Engineering and Applied Science. Some of you may have seen announced last year, um, they're, they'll be growing their faculty by 50% in the coming years. It's a massive investment by the university. A lot of those faculty that we're hiring are very uh, entrepreneurially oriented. I talked to a lot of them in the recruiting process. And they're uh, brilliant scholars, and they're doing incredible research, but they also want to see their research translated. They want to see the real world impact. And we're going to see more and more software startups. We're going to see more and more uh, climate tech startups. We have some of the leading scholars in quantum computing here in New Haven. I already have launched one very successful startup. We'll see more. So there's, there's going to be demand coming from a lot of additional uh, domains and industries as well. And so you talk about a lot of different types of users. Carter, does that mean you have to design your buildings to accommodate all those different users? Are there specific specs that are needed for biotech versus software versus other users? Yeah, for sure. And life science is probably one of the most challenging buildings uh, to, from a design standpoint. Uh, just from the chemical usage in the building, you have to have once through air. So very simply, the traditional office building recirculates almost 90% of its air, uh, brings it back up to the air handler, redistributes back down, reintroduces 10% outside air. Typical life science building uh, recirculates, or sorry, brings in 100% outside air. And so that doesn't sound like an unusual feature to a lab building until it's zero degrees out. Or if you think about the day where it's 97 degrees. I mean, you're basically bringing 100% outside air, dumping it into the space, letting it circulate around, and then exhausting that air out. And so it takes a tremendous amount of power cooling capacity, boiler capacity, duct capacity. That's why you have uh, much larger floor to floor heights in lab buildings. It's why you have bigger power feeds, bigger boilers, chillers. These buildings are just more robust than the typical office or lab building. But it's also why a tenant like Biolabs is so important. If you're a small startup tenant in New Haven, the thing that's most difficult to find is how do you get started with just an idea? You know, to go build a lab space somewhere and get that 100% makeup there, uh, to bring all that power, the benches, the equipment into your space, it's extremely expensive. It can be as much as five to 10 times a typical office. But you have to be in that environment for it to be a safe uh, environment to do your science in. 
And so a space like the Biolabs Incubator at 101 will be critical because it allows tenants to grow incrementally. They can come in day one, they can take a bench, a single bench, have a hood, and maybe a cube. And if they're successful, you see them grow incrementally and very quickly. And I would just step back for a second and say, I built incubators for the last 23 years. I built them at 300 George. We built them over in Science Park. And I would typically build an incubator that, call it 3,000 square feet. And you'd put a tenant in place. Uh, they'd be a startup tenant, and they had an idea and maybe a bridge round of capital. And if they were successful, they'd start hiring. And that 3,000 square feet, day one, you'd see two people in that space, and they'd be swimming in space. I'd come back a month later. If they were successful, they'd have 15 people. And then I'd come back three months later. They will have stuffed 48 people into a space that's 3,000 square feet. And so we started tracking it and saying, these fixed models of incubators just don't make sense because these life science tenants grow so quickly when they're successful that they actually fit the need for about a week in the tenant's <laughs> lifespan. And so we needed something that was more flexible, that could grow with them. And that's when we ran into the bio labs uh, team and said, this is exactly what we need. So from a space standpoint, these are extremely robust buildings that have tremendous demands for chemistry, biology, uh, meet all different types of science. But then within the space, to have a space like Biolabs, which will be 50,000 square feet. So if you come in and you have that idea that takes hold and you start hiring, you'll be able to grow bench by bench, hood by hood. You'll be able to take a graduate uh, suite or a a larger suite within Biolabs and really grow through the building. And then if you grow out of the Biolab space, you'll be able to grow upstairs or into an adjacent building or into the greater New Haven area. Uh, there's a significant number of other developers in town who are bringing on uh, great life science buildings over in the Science Park market uh, over on Church Street. So there are different offerings now out on the market uh, that are helping this market to really hold these tenants uh, in New Haven. And I see um, Alex Twining uh, in the audience, so he can hopefully chime in during the Q&A. Um, we do see, Mike, a lot of um, new buildings being converted to biotech in the market. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on in New Haven in this sector? Yeah. So um, as Carter had mentioned and others, the market is maturing, not just a startup, early startup market, um, but really an opportunity to grow and flex into other locations. Um, what we've tried to do is maintain some level of concentration in that regard, largely through our zoning ordinance and um, the BD3 zoning, which allows the more flexible lab conversions, such that um, there's an economy of scale, there's a, a real synergy with the School of Medicine, Yale New Haven Hospital, and then these growth districts. So Winchester works up at Science Park, um, a section of downtown around the Ninth Square, and then the Hill to Downtown District, for which Downtown Crossing, these projects are a part of, are where we see a real growth potential in the life sciences. And then as Josh had mentioned, there's next, right? So the applied sciences, quantum, data, uh, and we see a real growth opportunity, particularly around Science Hill where that um, center of influence at the university will be. But again, walkable, bikeable, which is all part of this you know, innovation economy that New Haven has a real core strength and a right to own. When we've left the region, which I wish we could do more these days, um, you see the real value people attach to the, um, to the European climate here, the ability to be outside, um, the scale and size of the architecture, the design quality. And that's why these uh, districts that are really closely attached to the university are working really, really well. There's so much work to do to really fill it in. David, you probably have the best perspective in terms of 
putting New Haven in comparison to other markets that where Harrison may invest. What are your thoughts on how New Haven competes on a relative basis? That's a good question. Um, look, I, I think New Haven is, um, I, I think New Haven's greatest asset, and one of the, I'm a little biased as an alum, but I think Yale, um, having Yale University here, and again, you know, with all the IP that's coming out, with kind of how forward think of the tr tech transfer offices, as well as just um, that is a huge asset, and it's 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 something that you know, as you kind of, if, as I stand here and kind of look around at, at the life sciences ecosystem, it's really it's got such a bright future, and and so you know, I would say um, you know there there's these established kind of super clusters as we call them as it comes to life sciences, where you have the, the Boston's, the San Diego's, and the San Francisco's. But if you look at all three of those clusters, they all started really with a with a large sponsor kind of institution and a large research institution. And so, um, with Yale being here and, and again the community supporting it, I don't see any reason why eventually it won't be um, at that level. I, I want to jump in on that and just add, uh, you know. David's great. He's been a great investor and supporter of the work that we do here. But they travel around and look at lots of different markets and try to see you know, if this market makes sense, if that market makes sense. Uh, they look for all the raw ingredients. You have to turn this around, though, and say, what does it look like from the tenant standpoint? And if you're a li young life science tenant in town, what are your options? You can grow here adjacent to the IP or the intellectual property that's coming out of Yale or where your science is founded, and then you can take that to the Bay Area. You can take it up to Cambridge or to the seaport or to New York. And so what does that look like? At minimum, it's twice as expensive. So the Boston market is typically uh, over $100 a foot net right now. We just signed a $120 lease. I love hearing that. So <laughs> keep, keep pushing rent up there. So uh, I look at that and say, from a tenant standpoint, the New Haven market has options, whereas the Boston market has had extraordinarily low occupancy or uh, vacancy rates. But more than anything, it's the New Haven market's half the cost. That's just on your fixed cost of real estate. The other component is labor. So if you go up to the Boston market, and as Alexion did, uh, they went up to the Boston market, and they immediately posted a whole bunch of uh, open positions. That's an extremely competitive marketplace up there uh, for, for talent. Whereas if you're a young life science company in the New Haven market, you really can be a big fish in a, in a somewhat smaller pond, but you're able to draw from both the, the New York and Boston markets from a labor standpoint. More cost effective to bring people here from a cost of living. So I think overall, uh, it's great to look at it from an investor or an owner standpoint, but ultimately you got to look at it from the tenant standpoint and say, far, far cheaper, great access to talent, and you can still be immediately adjacent to uh, collaborating university, hospital, and other institutions. Okay, I'll add one kind of real world perspective on this tenant view. So we often get. Um, we work together with the city, with Advanced CT, on uh, talking to companies that are considering moving to New Haven. And we had a conversation a couple months ago with the, a European biotech company where we were in a bake-off against a couple other cities that also have major research universities. And they came to town, and we had breakfast at the uh, study at the heirloom restaurant there at the study. And we were talking about New Haven, how great it is. And, um, and the, the CEO was there, and, and he was from... Um, actually, I'll obfuscate most of the details here because this hasn't been announced yet, but um, he was asking about the city, and I said, well, do you have 15 minutes? you want to go for a walk? And he said, sure. So we walk out, and we walk down Chapel Street 
to the corner of the green. We took a right and walked up College Street because I wanted to show them the steel coming out of the ground on this project. But just walking down that stretch of College Street between Chapel and Crown, he paused for a second. If, you've, if you haven't been down that street recently, you should go check it out. Like post-COVID, the city opened up all the sidewalks for the outdoor dining and everything. There's flowers everywhere hanging from the light posts. And he paused and he said, you know, this feels like a European city. And I was like, yes. <laughs> and um, it hasn't been announced yet, but uh, we won that bake-off, and that company is coming to New Haven. Great. And I think, you know, we always like to say New Haven is um, small enough to be friendly and large enough to be interesting. And I think that's very true. And I think when you look at the panel, there's also so much collaboration. It's so, you know, I asked each of these gentlemen to sit on the panel. It was immediately, oh, yes, yes, yes. I mean, the relationship, the dialogue, I think that also adds to the ability to execute and get things done. It's just the overall partnership that we have here. Um, I just got the 10-minute warning, so I'm going to um, ask one final question. Um, What's next for New Haven? What do you all see on the horizon for New Haven from your, from your individual perspective? Well, Carter, you know, more buildings. Bring them on. <laughs> Look, I mean, we've been committed to New Haven for a long time, and, and we see more buildings, uh, you know, in the immediate future. I, I think, as I said, this market is just beginning to mature. Uh, I am incredibly optimistic that for the first time, I feel like there's alignment between the city, the state government, from the university. I see the jo uh, work that Josh is doing now uh, is really accelerating this. Uh, I'm incredibly optimistic that there's going to be a, a significant amount of additional demand. David, more dollars? If, if <laughs> Carter and you guys will have us, we'll, we'll be happy to be here. Um, I mentioned earlier the sense of belonging and um, just to reinforce the point about cultural equity and creating a truly inclusive community takes all of us. Um, you know, part of this is a recruiting pitch for us today for you to look at a project here. And a lot of that has to do with being deeply connected throughout our community. Um, our black and brown communities lead the state, the nation in many respects in creative and cultural equity. It's an area of uh, specific focus for us. I did not see any of you at the high school youth concert on Wednesday, and next year I will be taking attendance. To <laughs> we all are a part of this inclusive movement. You too. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's uh, one of the reasons I, I took this job and came back to Yale was just that it feels like a, a moment in time where there's just so much potential, and there's kind of unlimited opportunity here. You know, Yale is going to keep growing the research enterprise, you know, there's, we're never, our researchers are never going to run out of new things to invent or new ideas. They're always going to be out on the forefront. So there's just this unlimited kind of engine of innovation that's, um, that's rooted here. And then it's up to us what we do with that and create the environment where those, uh, those ideas can take root here in New Haven, have the, the physical spaces, have the intellectual capital, um, have the, the uh, community. Uh, that gives rise to success of those ventures. Because in the end, the odds of our startups being successful, if they can be here and not have to go up to Boston or New York where the, the, the scientific founder can walk across the street to spend time with their startup rather than have to dedicate an entire day to take the train up to, to Cambridge, um, that makes a big difference. That makes a big difference in those early years of these startups and de-risking the science and helping them on their path to being successful. And our faculty want that. Um, our students want the opportunities here. Um, and so, you know, it's a, it's a really exciting time. And I give enormous credit to people like Carter um, and Mike who've been chopping wood in this market for many years. And I think in these startup markets, you get these flywheel effects where it takes a lot of work for a long time to get things going and start building that critical mass. But once that flywheel starts spinning, it really starts to go. And I feel like we're kind of at that moment right now where things, like if you charted out the, the square feet of private lab space in New Haven, it probably is like very slow, you know, it's got some steps in there. But I think we're gonna stay, you know, it's, we're at that point where it starts to go up exponential. The demand is gonna start to go exponential. Um, and it feels like we're right at that moment right now. So it's really exciting. Thank you. At this point, happy to open it up for questions. And I think I see a mic being brought around. So, uh, 
Thank you. Great presentation. I enjoyed all your comments. Just a question. If you were to dial back 20 to 25 years ago, when a lot of this was on the drawing board and some of you were involved, and Josh, you mentioned a lot of chopping wood has taken place during this period of time, what could have been done perhaps 20 years ago to have accelerated this process? And, uh, and and, and what might have happened or what might have been the turning point maybe five years ago or 10 years ago that's helped to accelerate this? Anyone? That's a, that's a really tough question. I think it's a good question. Um, I think Josh spoke about you know, just the slow momentum that gets built. And I think a lot of the components, a lot of the raw material was actually in place 20 years ago. Um, there was a, an enormous perception problem about New Haven 23 years ago when I first landed here. And it's been a struggle to get people over that perception. So it's been a lot of incremental steps I'm not sure what we could have done differently to accelerate that. I mean, I think the easiest thing to say is, you know, we could have maybe done more tech transfer and spun more companies out faster. But I'm not sure the market was ready to receive them. Uh, I think one of the interesting things is when we first started, you actually couldn't get a bank or a lending institution to come down and consider New Haven. Our first project, we did all cash. And until it was 100% leased, we really had a very difficult time getting financing because there wasn't a bank at the time that would lend in, in, into New Haven. Um, so I think, uh, I think it's about incremental movement here. And that momentum uh, shift has really occurred now. And I think it just takes time. Could we have had a huge bio fund like Massachusetts did? And could you have had better tech transfer? I think you could have had all of those things, but it still would have been a pretty uh, slow incremental program. Yeah, I, I think that's very fair. I mean, some of the changes that we're making today, I think you could argue we could have made longer ago and, and could have been enjoying maybe some of the benefits of those over time. Um, but there's also, you know, particularly at Yale, right, we're a 300-year-old institution with a very kind of rich culture and tradition. And, um, you know, any organization like that doesn't turn on a dime. You know, it has to kind of move and you have to bring all the pieces along. Um, and I think the university's um, uh, evolution over this period of time has been picking up steam. Um, but it is a question of like how much you could have pushed it 20 years ago, um, how quickly, versus you have to kind of grow into it and see the successes, see what some of your peers are doing, and kind of learn from that. Thank you. This is kind of a follow-up on sort of projecting forward. Um, I, I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Kendall Square, people may not realize, has actually been nearly 50 years in the making. So I wouldn't give ourselves too much of a hard time in terms of what we might have done differently. I think the life science sector obviously has matured tremendously. It's become an asset class that lots of people are interested in, and the employment base obviously has grown tremendously. And I wanted to ask about that because, um, you know, people talk about collaboration in places like Kendall Square, and that's really code for poaching each other's employees. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, you referred to the competitive um, job market and so forth, and that is a big factor and, frankly, a much bigger factor for most companies than the cost of real estate. So 120 bucks is a lot of money, but it's really about the employees. So I'm curious, what is the um, labor base, if you will, in the life sciences, um, in the employment in New Haven? And when you look down the road, look 10 years in the future or whatever, I mean, obviously, you know, Kendall Square started 
you know, with just MIT. And, you know, as David said, it was, you know, you need one. And there are cities all over the country that are doing exactly the same thing. And I think New Haven's better positioned than many of them. Um, but my question would be, at what point do you, what's the employment base you look at or how many companies are here, whatever the metric is, where you say, okay, now we're at, you know, the next level where it starts to feed on itself and you, you are no longer um, sort of competing against the Boston and San Diego and the other places like that so much as creating your own, your own vibrant uh, system that companies are attracted to, um, you know, because of the size of it already. Yeah, I'll take a first shot at this. I mean, I think um, in terms of the labor market here around bioscience, we've, we've built up quite good critical mass at this point to the extent where when a company does fail, their employees get hoovered up by other companies like very rapidly. So that's kind of like the first acid test is like when a company fails, do their employees have to move to, came to Kendall Square to find their next job? And the answer right now in this market is no. They get, they get picked up very quickly by other local companies. Um, and more, moreover, um, there's tremendous demand for more talent here, right? And it's at every level. So it's at the, in the C-suite um, where we've built up, a, I think, a great kind of network of, you know, kind of C-level biotech executives who kind of move from company to company over time. Um, but one dynamic that's changed there is, I think, in a post-COVID world where it's now kind of understood for a lot of these, these types of jobs, you don't have to be on site five days a week. We're seeing more and more now the founding CEO of one of our spinouts actually be somebody who lives in Boston and who will take the train down two or three days a week and work remotely a couple days a week, and that's fine, and that's happening a lot. So now we're able to tap into some other markets that, that don't require people to move their families, but that are now more accessible. At the kind of mid-tier, like bench scientists, maybe earlier in their careers, um, we're doing a lot uh, to do, I think, a better job connecting our academic institutions and the pipelines of our graduate students um, directly into these, these startup companies. Conventional wisdom with this group, and I, I've spoken to a lot of Yale students since I got here, there's still this kind of default mentality of graduate and move to, move to Cambridge or graduate and move to New York. That's just kind of what you do. Um, and we've been working hard to open their eyes to all of the opportunities that are right here in New Haven. And one quick example, that we uh, created a, a sprint internship program this past summer. Um, a couple of the biotech CEOs took the initiative to create this thing. In its first year, they placed 170 students in internships in local biotech companies in their, in their first year. Mm. And I think those internships are critical. You're right, you, get the, you get the tentacles out into the community. They get some full-time offers when they graduate. You get much more retention of our students. So there's a lot of momentum there. And then at the kind of lab tech, lab operations roles, we're working with the city. Um, and uh, one of our uh, faculty members, Craig Cruz, is taking initiative to create a job training program um, for New Haven residents who may not have a college degree, um, but uh, who can be trained on the job in like an apprenticeship type model, four to six months. We're lining them up with different companies. Carter's actually helping to support making this possible at 101 and Biolabs as well, where we can get them into lab tech jobs and get them onto a career path to participate in the growth in this market in ways that, as Michael alluded to earlier, help increase the diversity of our biotech companies, help create opportunity in the communities here, and ensure that the growth that we're creating is, is very inclusive for the community as well. We have time for one more question. Um, I wonder whether you, anyone could comment on whether they see uh, parallel developments in or competition from the Providence market. I, I can speak a little to that, just in, in the sense that uh, my prior uh, life, we, um, we developed and, uh, and operated uh, with our partners, um, with another developer, uh, <laughs> um, have, have a bunch of life science buildings that have gone up in Providence. Um, you know, Providence is a similar value proposition in that they, they, they have a university there. Um, that has provided some sponsorship as well, and it's it's you know driving distance to Boston, and it also has a kind of a value prop as well. I, you know, um, I, I think at the end of the day, if you look at the strength of the institutions, I, I think it's um, again my bias is clear, but I think I think there's there's a certain strength here. That's I think the the IP is probably stronger coming out of here as well, and um, and 
I would say the local community is also a, a lot um, more encouraging as well. So not to speak badly, I think those projects are doing quite well up there, but I think um, New Haven has a, has a, a lot of great resources um, going for it. I'd also say knowing those developments, physical proximity is essential. Uh, Josh spoke about it a bit. Uh, it's something that we've heard from our tenant base again and again. Physical proximity to where the science or the founding science laboratory